afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you all very much for, for coming to this session. And many thanks to the organizers of the SA AIDS conference who very generously gave us this late break a session uh, when we requested uh, for various reasons at a very late break a stage. So thank you for that. Um, it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, this whole session which, in which we're going to uh, share with you the results of the ECHO trial. Many of you in this room will be familiar with it, but it stands for the Evidence for Contraceptive Options and HIV Outcomes. And we're going to give you and share with you the primary results. Um, but just to say that I suspect that this will turn out to be one of the most important studies in the HIV field and SRH field, one of the most important joint studies that uh, probably we have done for many years. This is how we're going to run the session. We've got five presenters who I'm going to introduce to you, and they're going to present slides, and you'll see it and tell the story as it unfolds. I'm just going to give a few introductory remarks. My name is Helen Rees. I'm the executive director of the Witz Reproductive Health and HIV Institute at the University of Witwatersrand. I'll be followed by Dr. Nelly Mugo, who's head of the Sexual Reproductive Adolescent and Child Health Research Program in the Kenyan Medical Research Institute in Nairobi, and is also an associate research professor in the Department of Global Health in the University of Washington. She's going to talk about why there was a need to do this study. Um, then Dr. Tim Mastro, who's the chief science officer of FHI360, will give an important tribute to a colleague that many of you in this room might know, Dr. Ward Case. I won't say any more because he will tell you more, but this is a dear colleague who sadly, ah, <laughs> but Ward sadly passed away. And I can tell you if Ward were here today, he'd love to hear that singing. To my comrades, Amandla, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I was just, for the, for the sake of our, uh, uh, the comrades who have just joined us, I was just introducing the program uh, and saying that uh, Dr. Tim Mastro will make a tribute to a dear colleague, Dr. Ward Cates, as the third speaker. And then uh, Dr. Jared Beaton, who is the professor and vice chair of the Department of Global Health in the University of Washington School of Medicine and Public Health, uh, will present the results. And then Dr. James Chiari from the World Health Organization Department of Reproductive Health and Research will talk about WHO and the next steps. But I'd like you just to look at those five people because there are a couple of novel things I just want to point out before we start. One is that this study, despite being enormous, didn't have one single principal investigator or a two principal investigators and a co-PI. We did it through a management committee of the five people who are going to present here. And what was exciting about this management committee is that it was deliberately a mixture of African scientists and US scientists and the World Health Organization in anticipation of what the potential meaning of the results could be. So it's been an extraordinary partnership 
to drive what you'll see has been a very large study. But the other thing I think we're very proud of, well, I was asked this today by a journalist, what are you proud of? And one of the big things we're extraordinarily proud of has been the partnership with community. And the partnership with community has played itself out not only in the sites, which we'll talk about, but also at the global level. And the, the, the global community advisory group has given us a lot of advice and will be speaking later. So this will be the running order, and I won't reintroduce people. They'll introduce each other as we run through. So what's the starting point for the ECHO study? And I think uh, it's, it's probably one of the most basic things we ever teach to people who start learning the, the trade of medicine, and that safe and effective contraception is one of the most powerful public health tools that really contributes to the development of women and of children and of communities. As we are standing here today, we're all too aware that we've got 37 million people currently living with HIV, the majority of the, the over 50% of whom are women. And in the African region every year, there are approaching 600,000 new uh, infections every year. Modern contraceptive methods are absolutely critical for women and their empowerment and development. And over 700 million women worldwide are currently using these methods, and over 58 million women in the African region. And access to these methods not only is important and critically important for women's health and children's health, as we said, but also for economic empowerment and for women's empowerment and, and gender equity more generally. If we talk about the importance of contraception, there are a couple of things that we just see as the backdrop. First of all, this is what the distribution of contraceptives was in 2011, and although it's improved somewhat in the African region now, it's still way lagging behind other regions of the world. You can see in that ringed box, that is the unmet need for contraception. Well, that's the met need of contraception in the African region. At the bottom of that uh, bar, you can see in the dark turquoise color that, that uh, of, the, of the contraceptives being used, that dark purple represents injectable methods, mostly the injectable progestin, DMPA, IM. And so you can see that in our region, we've got a massive unmet need, and the predominant method that women are choosing to use and being given is the injectable progestin. So... Coming, coming now to why we did ECHO. So where did this all start? Um, and we have to ask ourselves why this took so long. This was an initial paper that really, if you like, started the discussion. This was from 1996, and it was a model that was done in a macaque monkey study, which showed that women who were given progesterone implants had a much... Uh, sorry, women, I should try again, monkeys, uh, that were given progesterone implants had a much increased risk of acquiring um, HIV than those that were not. And that was in 1996. And as a result of this, people said, how does this translate into women in the real world? And there were many studies that were done, but most of them were either cohort studies, observational studies, or studies where there was secondary analysis of a bigger study that was looking at something else, which meant that all of the studies that were done, even though there were many, many of them done and published, had limitations in how we could interpret them. We go and turn the clock on, and this was from 2015, where there were a series of attempts to try and bring all of this data together to say, what are we beginning to see? Do we see what we saw in the monkey model playing out in, 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 in clinical reality? And this was um, an individual participant uh, data meta-analysis bringing lots of studies together that looked at uh, whether this increased risk of DMPA was being seen and in other hormonal methods was being seen when we pulled that data together. And because these studies kept coming, WHO had a series of consultations. Every few years when a major study would come out, they would review the data and say, do we need to change guidance? Is this data strong enough to tell us that there is or isn't a problem with DMPA, IM, uh, that, and, and increased HIV acquisition risk? The media would pick up on some of these studies, and this is a range of newspapers from around the world. And you can see the kind of headlines that we had. And clearly, if you're getting headlines like this, it's going to impact on women's willingness um, and confidence in these methods. And the modelers became involved. And this was a model that was done before, just before we started the ECHO trial. And in this model, what the modelers had done is they'd looked at the map of the world and said, where is HIV 
of where is HIV prevalence and incidence highest, and also then they superimposed where have we got the highest use of injectable, where, of, of injectable progestins. And in the dark red, which you can see is South and East Africa, where the HIV epidemic, as you know, is the greatest. That's where you saw a high HIV incidence and prevalence, but also a high use of injectable progestins. But this model doesn't tell you that there's any cause and effect between those two things. The only way to answer this question was to do what's called a randomized trial, and we're going to explain that to you now. So we put together this ECHO trial consortium. We, I've mentioned the, the uh, management committee that's sitting here, but I, in the audience I see some of my colleagues who are principal investigators from the sites. Um, and there were 12 sites that we'll also describe to you. Um, but truly this was a, a real partnership that has run strongly and well for many years. Uh, this is just a small sample. We think there are probably up to 500 people who've been involved in this study, and this is a small sample of, of us getting together in one of the many meetings as we planned this study. So with that, um, as I said, we're going to run it now, and uh, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Nelly Mugo, who's going to give you more detail of why we wanted to do the ECHO trial. Good afternoon. Okay. Um, thank you, Helen. So, as Helen has mentioned, we have 30 years of epidemiological and laboratory studies that try to determine if there's truly an increased HIV risk associated with the use of hormonal contraceptives. Some of these studies showed that progestin-only injectables, particularly intramuscular <coughs> injectable depomedroprogesterone medro acetate were linked to increased HIV risk, but other studies did not show that association. One meta-analysis done not so long ago um, showed an increased risk, approximately 40 to 50 percent. Now, if you look at the chart on the side, that's a selection of very high-quality studies that inform the meta-analysis. And at the top bar, you see there are studies that showed up to a two-fold increased risk that created real concern in the field about this association. As we looked at data, it was also clear that there were very few studies that had looked at HIV risk with other highly effective contraceptives, such as the intrauterine devices, hormonal implants, including, including levonorgestrel implants, LNG, which are commonly used. Over the past number of decades, as Helen has mentioned, the World Health Organization has repeatedly reviewed evidence to look at this linkage to determine guidance. And in 2017, after the meta-analysis, uh, WHO summarized that women at risk for HIV can use progestin-only injectables, but should be advised that there's still concern about a possible HIV risk, but there was uncertainty if there was a real causal relationship. And it also gave guidance on what women can do to minimize this risk. So that left women and providers and policymakers still unclear on what to do with that data. We also recognize that women need to know whether using a contraceptive method will increase their risk of getting HIV. They also need to make informed choices about which contraceptive is best for them and what HIV prevention intervention they should use at any one time. So why did we do ECHO? Why a randomized trial after all that data over three decades? So we have injectable intrauterine and implantable contraceptives, which offer high contraceptive safety and efficacy and are currently prioritized for programmatic delivery. And actually in my, in my country, Kenya, the implants are increasing um, in use and across the continent. So a randomized trial provides the highest quality evidence to enable women to make fully informed choices, to inform clear counseling messages for the clinicians and also offer guidance for policymakers and, and programs. So ECHO was a multi-center, as you were told, it had 12 sites, open label, randomized clinical trial comparing HIV incidence and contraceptive benefits 
and using <clears throat> an HIV incidence and using one of the three highly effective lenses contraceptive methods, that's the intramuscular, DMPA, the copper IUD, and the levonorgestrel implant. The primary objective was to compare HIV incidence amongst women randomized to these three methods, again, of DMPAIM, copper IUD, and LNG implant. We also had secondary objectives, which included comparison of um, randomized methods and rates of pregnancy incidence, contraceptive method continuation, and serious adverse events across methods, and the adverse events that would lead into method discontinuation. The ECHO trial began in December 2015, and participant follow-up was concluded in October last year, 2018. So what was the rationale for selecting these three methods? We know we have many other methods in the field, so why did we choose DMP intramuscular? This was included because it was the contraceptive that observational data had suggested could possibly increase HIV susceptibility and is commonly used in many African settings that also have high HIV prevalence, as Helen has just shown in that graph. We also included the copper IUD because it's highly effective and it's a non-hormonal contraception. The LNG implant represented another progestin-based contraceptive, and it also it's one of the long-acting reversible methods like implants is also increasing use across Africa. LNG is also a common progestin in oral contraceptive and in multi-purpose prevention technologies that are currently in development. The trial was undertaken in 12 sites in four countries, Eswatini, Kenya, South Africa, and Zambia. And as you were told, we have many of the PIs in the audience with us. So who was eligible to participate as a participant in the ECHO trial? There must have been women who desired effective contraception, who were not pregnant, who were HIV negative, with an age between the age of 16 and 35 years, and who'd agreed to use the assigned method for 18 months, and who had not used injectable intrauterine or implantable contraception six months prior to trial um, enrollment, and were able to provide written informed consent. Women who were recruited into the ECHO trial were based on their re res residence in geographic, um, geographies that had high risk of HIV, but not on individual characteristics of HIV risk. <coughs> So we didn't profile women who engage in the ECHO trial for risks such as transactional sex or history of STIs or self-reported risk behavior. At enrollment, women were assigned at equal ratio to receive either DMPAIM or copper IUD or the LNG implant. Women who were assigned to DMPAIM were provided the injectable every three months on site at the clinics. The LNG implant placement was confirmed at every visit, and the copper IUD placement was reconfirmed after one month when clinically indicated and at the final visit, exit visit in the trial. Study follow up occurred one month after enrollment to address contraceptive side effects. Then quarterly for the total duration of 18 months of follow-up. During follow-up, we had HIV testing, contraceptive counseling, and safety monitoring. Women enrolled in the trial were, were counseled that they could discontinue use of their randomized method. They could choose another trial method or a different method or no method at all. So after randomization, they still had some choices. Women discontinuing their randomization method were retained in the study. In 2017, when we had the updated WHO guidance, as I mentioned earlier, all women enrolled in the trial were updated on the information on the WHO guidelines. At every visit, ECHO trial participants received a comprehensive package of HIV prevention services this included HIV risk reduction counseling, 
Partners were, they were encouraged to bring in their partners, and the partner participants received HIV and STI testing and management. They had access to condoms, and as PrEP uh, delivery became part of national guidelines, all trial sites provided pre-exposure prophylaxis. The HIV counseling message was implemented consistently for all participants, and there was emphasis placed that none of the three contraceptive methods used in the study provided protection from HIV or STIs. ECHO had a lot of oversight. Every clinical trial site had an ethics review. We had periodic reviews by qualified independent clinical monitors. We had a safety, um, safety oversight committee that was available to sites 24 seven for clinical advice throughout the period of the trial. We had a very engaged and active global community advisory group. Some of the members are in the audience with us. And every site had a community advisory board with good participatory practice plans at every single site. And we also had an independent data safety monitoring board which met twice a year. So it's my pleasure to hand over to my colleague, Tim Mastro, to continue with the presentation. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. I'm Tim Mastro with FHI 360. Really a privilege for me to be here with the team and with you all in Durban. Um, so while the ECHO team is, is pleased to be here on the stage presenting the results that you're going to be hearing today, an important member of our team is not with us today, Dr. Ward Cates, who was president of research at FHI 360 for most of his 22 years with the organization and was very instrumental in conceptualizing and getting ECHO started. We lost Ward following a, a courageous battle with cancer just three years ago, and Ward lived to see the, the start of ECHO, and he was working on the science of ECHO and mentorship of colleagues up until the last weeks of his lives. So we think about Ward every day, and we dedicate the work that we're doing here today to Ward. I first met Ward 30 years ago when I joined the Centers for Disease Control, where Ward was at the time. And uh, I think it's fair to say Ward was more than one in a million. He was truly one of a kind. And I suspect that anybody that knew Ward would say the same. Ward had this remarkable ability that when you talk to people that knew Ward, everyone is convinced that they were his best friend. <laughs> Ward would often take short flights from Raleigh, Durham to Washington, DC. He'd meet somebody on the plane. By the end of the flight, they were best friends. This person was convinced that they had a unique relationship with Ward. He was just that kind of a person. So Ward was bright, energetic, charismatic, remarkably smart and productive. He had more than 450 publications, was a member of the Institute of Medicine. He was a physician scientist who trained at Yale University, uh, was an epidemic intelligence service officer at CDC, got a, also an MPH from, from Yale, and before that he got a master's degree at Cambridge University in modern European history just to round out his curriculum vitae. So Ward was really a remarkable person that I think everybody will remember well. Um, there was one thing that perplexed me always, that Ward was a decade older than me, but he always seemed to be a decade younger than me, and I could never figure out how he managed to do that. So Ward was, why is ECHO important for Ward? Now, Ward was a very perceptive scientist, very curious. Uh, he was a champion for the integration of women's reproductive health and HIV throughout his career. Uh, he was a real champion for family planning HIV integration. He joined the Centers for Disease Control as an Epidemic Intelligence Service Officer in 1974. He quickly became chief of the abortion surveillance branch and did really groundbreaking work to understand abortion services, which led to improved methods, improved practices, which led to the saving of many lives. Ward then transferred to be the director of the Sexually Transmitted Infection Disease Branch at the Centers for Disease Control, and he was in that role when the AIDS epidemic started in 1981, and he very quickly understood the global importance of a sexually transmitted viral infection that would go on to be known as HIV infection, and is why we're having a conference here in Durban in South African AIDS. So Ward was able to weave together his understanding of reproductive health, especially for women, 
in the HIV epidemic. He went on to spend 20 years as the uh, principal investigator of the HIV Prevention Trials Network, was very involved in, in many important trials, including uh, microbicide research study. He was an, an investigator on the Caprisa 004 study, was a good friend of many people here in Durban, South Africa. And Ward was always looking for ways to improve uh, the people's health of the world. He was a very rigorous scientist and always uh, would encourage us to follow the data. So the reason we're here is that there have not been high quality data to inform women's choices on contraception of whether or not there really is an association between hormonal contraception and HIV risk. So Ward was, was troubled by this lack of high quality data and was one of the people along with Helen Reese and others to uh, basically champion the idea for a high quality randomized controlled trial to develop high quality evidence that would inform this public health conundrum of uh, the need for safe contraception for women, but also the potential for risk that had to be resolved. Um, so Ward made the case for the randomized control trial, which is one of the reasons we're here today. He also used his, his charisma and his influence. Uh, he and Helen and others uh, went to the donors and finally were able to convince them to contribute the, the $50 million it took to implement the ECHO study over the last few years. So without Ward, we wouldn't be here. One of his mantras was win-win. Whenever there was a challenge, Ward advocated everybody, let's look for a way that both sides win rather than a winner and a loser side of things. And I think it's fair to say that the ECHO study is a win-win for the people of the world. Uh, over the last 50 years, Ward had really been a mentor and changed the careers of many public health scientists, physicians, and public health implementers, including myself, and he really had a unique skill for mentoring. So ECHO is an important part of Ward's legacy. We thank him, and we know he'd be proud of all the work that's being presented here today. And we know that Ward would have loved to see the data, and so now you're all going to see the data, and I'm confident that Ward is seeing it as well. So now you're going to hear about the data from my friend and colleague, Jared Baton. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a real honor to be, for all of us to be here and to be able to talk about the results of ECHO. Before we, get in, before we go to the results, we want to talk about the quality of the trial. Before we started the trial, the study team, along with its Data Safety Monitoring Board and its funders, agreed to key operational metrics that would be reviewed continuously during the study and if not met, would trigger evaluation of whether the trial would continue. Because not doing the trial well meant that the result would not be, would not be reliable. These metrics included the pace of accrual, the continuation of contraceptive method, retention, and other factors. I'm pleased to say that all of the metrics were fulfilled, if not exceeded, in doing the trial. So we feel the trial is done well. The trial was designed with 80% statistical power to detect a 50% increase in the hazard of HIV for each of the contraceptive methods compared to each of the others. Thus, what you'll see today are three comparisons. DMPAIM compared to copper IUD, DMPIM compared to the LNG implant, and copper IUD compared to the LNG implant. We chose a 50% increase in, in HIV risk based on formative work with stakeholders to determine a meaningful difference that would inform policy change. We assumed HIV incidence would be, uh, background would be approximately 3.5% per year, a two-sided type 1 error rate of 0.04 for each comparison, 10% loss to follow-up, and 10% method discontinuation. And under these assumptions, the sample size of 7,800 was planned. The trial enrolled 7,829 women, again, who were ages 16 to 35, desiring contraception, willing to be randomized. 2,609 were assigned the MPAIM, 2,607 the copper IUD, and 2,613 the LNG implant. The average age was 23 years, and 63% were less than 25 years of age. Most, just over 80%, were not married, and most, again, just over 80%, had previously been pregnant at least once. Half reported not using a condom with their last sexual act, 
But importantly, only 7% reported more than one partner in the prior three months. Nevertheless, sexually transmitted infections were common. 18% had chlamydia infection, 5% gonorrhea, and 38% herpes simplex virus type 2. We measured blood levels of um, medroxyprogesterone acetate, DMPA, in, in a subset of participants from the enrollment visit. 13% had levels suggesting potential use in the prior six months. Follow-up in the trial was very, very good. 99% of women completed at least one <coughs> post-randomization HIV test. Retention was 93.6% at the final study visit and more than 91% at each visit in all three of the groups. A total of 10,409 person years of follow-up were accrued. Contraceptive method use was very high. 99.4% of women accepted their randomized method at enrollment. And participants used their method for 92% of the time that they were in the study. On the right, that, uh, that is 93.1% among those assigned DMPIM, 89% among those assigned the copper IUD, and 93.7% among those assigned the LNG implant. So all were very high. And for DMPIM, 99.2% of injections were provided on site. PrEP became a standard of care relatively late into the course of the trial. Nevertheless, 622 women took up PrEP relatively late into the study, and the numbers were relatively similar across the three randomized groups. In the end, PrEP use overlapped with 195 women years in, in the, of the trial, which is just about 2% of total follow-up in the trial. The inclusion of PrEP in the trial is something the study team is extremely proud of, and it demonstrates the ability to roll PrEP into large clinical trials and to an integrated HIV family planning program settings. So the primary results. The results will concentrate on the primary, the primary outcomes of the trial. In total, 397 of the 7,829 women enrolled in the trial acquired HIV during, during follow-up. That translates into a rate of 3.81% per year. And here are the results break across the study groups. I'll draw your attention first to the table at the top right. 143 infections occurred among women assigned DMPIIM at an HIV incidence of 4.19% per year. 138 infections occurred among women assigned the copper IUD at a rate of 3.94% per year. And 116 infections occurred among women assigned the LNG implant at a rate of 3.31% per year. The cumulative probability curve demonstrating the accumulation of HIV infections in the three arms is presented at the bottom in the large, and then an inset takes that same graphic and makes it with a different, with a different axis just exceeding at, at 10%. And as you can see, in blue DMPIM, green copper IUD, uh, LNG implant, and red copper IUD, the three curves are quite close to each other and uh, uh, touch each other and, and, and points cross during the, point of, during the course of the study. <coughs> this is the same table from the last graphic, and now let's compare these rates. For DMPAIM versus the copper IUD, the hazard ratio was 1.04, with a 96% confidence interval of 0.82 to 1.33, and a p-value of 0.72. For DMPIM versus the LNG implant, the hazard ratio was 1.23, with a 96% confidence interval of 0.95 to 1.59, and a p-value of 0.097. And for the copper IUD versus the LNG implant, the hazard ratio was 1.18, with a 96% confidence interval of 0.91 to 1.53, and a p-value of 0.19. 
A number of subgroup analyses were pre-planned and were done, including those defined by age for women younger and older than 25 years, and for women with or without herpes simplex virus type 2. Results were similar to the overall findings. In until the time of first discontinuation of randomized method, Though the, that analysis used causal analysis methods, including inverse probability weighting, as well as adjustment for baseline and time-dependent covariates, the results in that sensitivity analysis were consistent with the primary intention to treat results that you just saw. We are standing here in Durban today, and, we complete, and the results from the South Africa sites are particularly relevant to where we are. Uh, we, uh, as part of the review process for the, for the study, for the study manuscript, we were asked to perform a post hoc analysis to look at results limited to the South Africa sites. As mentioned before, South Africa was nine of the 12 sites in the study and accounted for 86% of the HIV infections in the study. Here is the breakdown of infections in the cross South Africa sites, 124 among those assigned DMPAM. 118 among those assigned the copper IUD, and 103 among those assigned the LNG implant. All the HIV incidences are greater than 4% per year. And the results of the three comparisons are very consistent with those demonstrated in the overall intention to treat analysis. Pregnancy rates were low. The intention to treat analysis of pregnancy is presented on top the continuous use analyses, that is, up until discontinuation of randomized method is presented at the bottom. Pregnancy rates were low in all three randomized groups. And most pregnancies, 71% specifically, occurred among women who had previously discontinued their randomized method. All methods had high contraceptive effectiveness, uh, particularly as shown here in the bottom table. Although the two hormonal methods had slightly lower pregnancy rates than the IUD. Serious adverse events were rare across all three groups, presented here in the top line of this table. Adverse events that resulted in methane discontinuation were also uncommon, about 7% of women overall. However, they were more common among women assigned to the copper IUD or the LNG implant, approximately 8%, as you see in the, on the bottom corner on the right and in the center, compared to DMPIM, where it was about 4%. Thus, in summary, this multi-country randomized trial measured HIV incidence among women assigned to one of three highly effective contraceptive methods. Acceptance of randomized method, contraceptive continuation, and retention were all very high across all three methods. All three methods were effective at preventing pregnancy, and all were well tolerated. Sadly, HIV incidence was high in the study across all three groups. <clears throat> We designed this trial to detect a 50% increase in HIV incidence for each of the contraceptive methods compared to each of the others. None of the comparisons showed a 50% increase in HIV incidence. None of the comparisons showed a 50% increase in HIV incidence, and none of the effects were statistically different. These results from the primary intention to treat analysis, analyses among predefined subgroups, and sensitivity analyses limited to continuous use of randomized method, all had consistent findings for, for the comparisons. Under the design of the study, an observed approximately 30% increase in HIV incidence would have been found to be statistically significant, and hazard ratios less than approximately 1.17 would have excluded a 50% increase in risk from the confidence interval. DMPA and copper IUD, again to show these, had very, very close uh, com comparable HIV risk, as shown here. DMPIM and copper IUD both had estimates greater than 1.17 and less than 1.30 compared to the LNG implant, with confidence intervals that included both no difference and a 50% increase. We acknowledge that for, an, for individual women's decision-making, uh, that even a relatively small effect, smaller than a trial like this could, could detect, could be important for contraceptive and HIV prevention decision-making. 
all three contraceptive methods in the study were well tolerated. The adverse events that we saw were generally within the spectrum of common side effects for these methods. All three methods had high contraceptive effect effectiveness with pregnancy rates approximately 1% per year or less when in use. Fewer women using DMPA discontinued their method due to adverse events due to side effects compared to women using either the IUD or the LNG implant. And the pregnancy rate for DMPA users was the lowest of the three. ECHO included three highly effective contraceptive methods available in the African region, including one non-hormonal method and two different progestin-only methods. Our results may not be fully generalizable to other contraceptive methods not included in the study. We enrolled women in the study who desired effective contraception. There was no placebo or no, con or no contraceptive group in the trial. From our perspective, the salient question for a woman desiring contraception is how she may weigh the relative risks and benefits of the different methods. And in that case, no method is not part of the calculus. We recognize that the regular counseling, scheduled follow-up, on-site contraceptive delivery, and clinical management of contraceptive side effects in the study contributed to high method continuation. Nevertheless, we think the trial demonstrates an exemplar that delivery of high-quality contraceptive services to support the use of both the copper IUD and the LNG implant across multiple African settings shows that this is possible with appropriate investment in training, clinical competency, human resources, management of side effects, and logistical support. Sadly, in spite of an individualized HIV prevention package to pr provided to all participants throughout follow-up, as well as countrywide HIV treatment and prevention programs, HIV incidence was high in this population, approximately what was expected in the design of the trial, but nevertheless still too high. And STI prevalence at baseline was also, was also high. Our results strongly emphasize the need for more aggressive H HIV and STI prevention and management efforts for African women including PrEP and HIV prevention integrated into contraceptive services. Thus, in conclusion, many women in Africa are at risk for HIV infection as well as for morbidity and mortality from unintended pregnancy. This well-executed trial did not find a substantial difference in HIV risk among the methods evaluated, and all methods were safe and highly effective. These results underscore the importance of continued access to these three contraceptive methods, as well as expanding contraceptive services, complemented by high quality HIV and STI prevention options. To reiterate, women's informed choice in sexual and reproductive health services is essential. The evidence from ECHO will enhance women's contraceptive decision making and assist providers and policymakers in delivering high quality rights-based contraceptive care. We are all enormously grateful to the 7,829 women who gave their time and who gave their time, their volunteerism, and their dedication to participate in this trial and for the communities around them that supported this work. We are grateful to the Trials Data Safety and Monitoring Board the Global Community Advisory Group, as well as Community Advisory Boards at each site, as well as the Overseeing Ethical Review Committees for their expertise, their guidance, and their dedication. We thank the funders of ECHO, who had the confidence to invest in this globally important study, and they are all shown here. And finally, those of us, as, as, as mentioned earlier today by, by Helen, those of us who are standing on stage today do so as just a few members of what has been a large study team working all together. Here presented are, the, are, are just a snapshot of those individuals, including all of the principal investigators of the study sites, as well as members of the study core. And uh, attached to this publication that will be coming out is the full list of individuals who worked on the study. We are incredibly lucky to have been able to work together as a study team and to be able to demonstrate that this trial that was so challenging to start and so challenging to do could be done. I invite you to view, uh, to view the ECHO website where we will have continuously updated information from the trial. 
I also want to report that the results will be published later today by The Lancet, the journal The Lancet, on their online first at the website listed here. Otherwise, search for Lancet online first. Results will be available later today. And now I'll hand to our, my colleague, James Curie, WHO. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of WHO, I uh, would really like to congratulate him and acknowledge the participants and all those who And uh, WHO welcomes the results of the ECHO trial. And uh, we find that the results are uh, reassuring. Uh, one of the important findings, I think, is that the methods uh, both had high levels of safety and and all of them were very well accepted, uh, which supports that actually there can be many methods that women can use uh, successfully in the, in the continent. Uh, we are reassured that there was no statistically significant difference in the HIV infection uh, rates. And uh, for those probably will be challenge to understand this concept of statistical significance. Uh, the idea is that the observed differences, if any, were less than 30% in this uh, study. And as was pointed out, probably it will be important to know that smaller differences may be important for women, but we have to also look at what we need to focus on if we are to be effective in preventing HIV transmission. Will it be any small difference that we can find or other key drivers of the HIV epidemic? And the HIV incidence, uh, though expected for the chosen sites, was really high uh, in these sites, and it will be very important for us to look at what can be done to address uh, this issue. Uh, going forward, there are several key considerations for WHO that we'll have to take into account as we think what needs to be done in response to their core results. One is that access to preferred contraceptive methods should be maximized, and women should have access to a broad range of methods, while at the same time ensuring that we protect their health. And women also have a right to the latest and best information and to access this range of methods that should be both effective and acceptable to them. The current levels, as was highlighted by Professor Helen Rees at the beginning, of unmet need in many developing countries is really not acceptable. We have to take strategies uh, that we address this high unmet need that we find in our regions. And there's also need to step up HIV prevention efforts particularly in high burden countries and particularly for young women as these that participated in the ECHO trial. Uh, this has been said that this has been a long story and WHO has really been at the forefront as the evidence has unfolded to review the guidelines. Just the frequency of revision of these guidelines highlights how uncertain uh, we have been about the nature of the evidence. And ECHO for us, I think, uh, pre provides the most robust uh, data that we have uh, to date. And we've had uh, highlights of why we think that the ECHO uh, data is really important. We've heard about the randomized nature of the study, the high retention, and also the high method continuation. But I would like to highlight three other aspects that make this data really robust for us who are in the contraceptive world and thinking about guidance on uh, contraception for women at high risk of HIV. ECHO was designed as a contraception and therefore measurement of the method exposure was actually done very meticulously in this study. We really do understand very well what method women were using when they were using it and when they changed. And the study also enrolled women who wanted to use contraception. This was the criteria of enrollment. It was not enrollment based on other criteria 
as has been done in some of the other ancillary studies. And the methods studied have acted in also very different ways because one of the concerns that may be raised is that somehow all the methods were increasing HIV infection risk. But because these methods are very different, it will be very difficult to imagine that they were all acting uh, in the same uh, direction. And I think that is a very important point for the ECHO uh, trial. Uh, going forward, uh, WHO has uh, plans uh, to, to act on the ECHO results. One is that we'll do the evidence uh, synthesis and uh, including looking at values and preferences, uh, reviewing some of the additional st studies that have come out since our 2016 review of this evidence. And remember that as we think about new guidance, we will include the ECHO results as additional evidence on this issue, and we'll have to take into account the previous evidence that has accumulated over the years. Uh, once we've done this synthesis of the evidence, we'll uh, convene a guideline development group, and this process has actually already been initiated. Uh, in the last two weeks of May, at the WHO website, we advertised proposed members of the guideline development group. We have received feedback on those members and included their bio sketches and conflict of interest declarations. And we'll be reviewing those inputs so that we can finalize membership of the guideline development uh, group, which is scheduled to meet on 29th and 30th of July this year. And we anticipate that new recommendations will be available by the end of August uh, this year. The other thing that we'll be doing is providing technical support uh, to the countries. In preparation for the ECHO trial results, we have already worked with various countries to prepare for results dissemination, and we'll support the countries to communicate these results and also to respond in terms of any concerns that may be raised uh, as a response to these uh, results. And we are also working with countries to strengthen HIV and sexual reproductive health integration. As has been pointed out, this is a very important issue that is coming up from the ECHO results. And also looking at continuing strengthening of access to various method options and choice for women. So WHO guidelines, as uh, you know, are highly respected globally. And the reasons that the countries will respect the WHO guidelines is that really it is done as a very systematic uh, process. We ensure that it is independent and that they really examine the evidence uh, very thoroughly. But the guidelines do focus on the user's needs. And therefore, in development of these guidelines, we'll have women needs at the center as a priority. But it must also be based on the highest uh, quality of evidence. And I thank the ECHO team because the announcement of these results has also coincided with availability of the printed uh, manuscript, which is peer reviewed, which will enable us not only to look at the results presented here tonight, but also the detailed results that are in the manuscript. We'll incorporate multiple processes to ensure that we minimize bias. And the process is very transparent so that you'll be able to access all judgments and decision making. And in the WHO website, in the guidelines, you can see what decision was made and what evidence led to that uh, decision and the reasons uh, that decision was made. Uh, also, uh, just for information, we have various resources that will be available in our WHO uh, website. Uh, to support response to the ECHO trial. Uh, we have a WHO statement uh, which uh, highlights a WHO response to the ECHO trial, indicating that as we go to the process of, development, of developing new guidelines, countries should continue to use the current guidelines that are available on contraception for women at high risk of HIV infection. We have responses for frequently asked questions and we do also have 
the current WHO recommendations on use of contraception by women at high risk of HIV. We also have key messages for policymakers, providers, and women, and these messages are tailored both for high and low uh, prevalence uh, countries, because sometimes there are questions that are being asked if the country does not have a high prevalence of HIV, is this trial really still important? And we have messages that address uh, those concerns. Uh, the World Health Organization uh, has been at the front line to make sure that we engage the people whose, whose uh, lives are impacted by our guidelines in the processes. And the Director General has actually established uh, the WHO Advisory Group of Women Living with HIV and this is an advisory group that will be regularly advising uh, WHO on various guidelines uh, regarding uh, women living with HIV. Uh, later uh, in July, early July, on 10th and 11th, we'll be convening a meeting of the 14 countries uh, which have a high burden of HIV and discussing plans on how to expand method mix and promote choice and also how to strengthen HIV prevention in family planning services as a response to these ECHO trial results. So thank you very much, and uh, I have a link there to the WHO website. As I've said, we have a specific site where we have uh, all information on contraception and uh, HIV, and all those uh, resources will be available uh, there. I would like to hand back to, to Helen uh, to invite the panel. Thank you very much to all the speakers. Um, if we could go back, please, to that last slide. If you could put the last slide back up again. Thank you. So we've asked a, a panel of, of three colleagues to make just a three-minute statement about how they perceive the results from their perspective, and then we're going to open up discussion from the floor. Um, and each one you'll see has a very different constituency and responsibility. So Dr. Marciana Anono is a site investigator in Kenya from the Kemri. Dr. Yogan Pillay, well known to many people here, is the Deputy Director General in the Department of Health. And Ms. Yvette Raphael is um, both from the Advocacy for Prevention for HIV and AIDS, but was also a very vocal member and supporter of the ECHO Global Community Advisory Group. So I'll start with Marciana, if you'd like to give a three-minute comment. Good afternoon. Um, I think the generous sentiment as we have been uh, disseminating this to the participants has been one of uh, relief. And uh, I myself, as a, as a woman, and I'm talking as a Kenyan, we like saying me, I. I am very happy and very relieved with these results. Um, already as a country, you know, we already have a limited palette of uh, contributions from. And so having a, a, a negative result, whichever combination it was, would have really complicated um, the way we make our choices as women. However, we are... Uh, I think I am very concerned regarding the high HIV prevalence, especially given the fact, incident, sorry, especially given the fact that we already have um, a part, sort of like a suit of interventions to prevent uh, HIV. And I think that if there was ever a time to revitalize the message for HIV and um, reproductive health integration, that time is now. I think that there is... Um, there's a danger in a, in a single story when you say, uh, when you talk about contraception in the absence of HIV or you talk about HIV in the absence of uh, contraception. And so I think that going forward, we really need to bring these two discussions uh, to the table. And lastly, you know, when we started implementing uh, ECHO, many of our providers did not have any experience in inserting the IUD, uh, inserting the implant. There's also a lot of myths and misconceptions in the community regarding these uh, two methods, and so we're really beginning from scratch. And we had to work to train our providers, and we had to engage communities, particularly the men, and in our setup, the mothers-in-law, and bring them to this, uh, this table. 
And um, I think the fact that we are, we saw that 99% of the women were able to accept uh, being on any contraceptive method, uh, we saw them continuing, you know, 92% of them continuing on a method right till the 18 months shows that, you know, that these methods were acceptable, that it's actually possible to scale up this, these methods. And that when women are provided with adequate information, when their side effects are well managed, they are, they are actually able to continue on these methods. And so I think as a, as a researcher, as a provider, this is something that um, we as providers can take, can take home and begin to implement in our facilities. Uh, being able to take time to cancel these uh, women, uh, maybe to leverage the materials that ECHO uh, developed uh, to increase the utilization of these three methods. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if I can move to Jürgen. <coughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much to the organizers for inviting us to comment. Um, I've got four <coughs> things that I'd like to say. The first is, uh, of course, to thank the researchers and the funders. Uh, $50 million is a lot of money, but I think it was well spent, and I'm sure you'll agree with me. Uh, my only regret then is that we didn't have the additional arms that some of us would have liked at the beginning of the study, but clearly <coughs> the cost implications were beyond the reach of, I think, our funders. But we would have liked to see in a few more arms uh, in the study. Um, the reason the Department of Health was closely, associ closely associated with the study was, and fully supported it is the large number of women in South Africa that use DMPA in South Africa. You know, in, in the last financial year, over 6.2 million doses were used in South Africa against uh, 4.2 million uh, for the oral contraceptives, uh, 51,000 IUCDs inserted, and 213,000 implants inserted. So you can see that it's a method of choice for a significant number of women in our country. The, third, the point I want to make about WHO, and forgive me, James, the previous, the previous uh, advice from the WHO really didn't help us all that much. Now, I fully understand why, because you didn't have the evidence. But, and I just hope, James, that the next evidence doesn't read like this, and I quote from the WHO. Given the importance of this issue, women at high risk for HIV infection should be informed that progesterone-only injectables may or may not increase their risk of HIV acquisition. We cannot have that kind of language in the new guidance because it's, it won't help countries in our region. So we want more definitive um, advice going forward. My last point is about the implications of the results. And like my colleagues have said, we are concerned about the high levels of STI infection uh, beyond HIV. We are concerned about low condom use at last sex at about 50%. We are concerned about high HIV incidence in all three groups. Even small increases are a concern and really, really will help us focus on how we advise women. Um, we must remember that the research compared three different types of contraceptives against each other. So it was a head-to-head -head against each other and that's why I'm uh, you know, I still lament the lack of additional arms. It's not the researcher's fault, it's we just couldn't get the money. My sixth point is around integration with HIV, uh, between HIV and sexual and reproductive health, including PrEP. And I do think that, you know, while the WHO has urged us to move to person-centered care, we are really finding it difficult at the coalface to do exactly that. Uh, because, you know, we have to integrate all services, not just HIV and, SA, and sexual and reproductive health. And it speaks to really the quality of the services we provide with respect to sexual and reproductive health. I look forward to also hearing from the researchers some of the more information you collected, and because that will give us more of a nuance on how to program and how to strengthen our services. And then finally, James, I'm glad that the WHO has moved rather rapidly in giving us this advice. I was hoping that the advice will come sooner than August, but I guess we'll have to live with August. Thank you very much. And uh, Yvette. Amandla. Amandla. Um, I know it's a, it's a research sent, uh, 
a research presentation, but at the center of this is women in the community. And when we say Amandla, we know exactly what it means. We would like to say to the researchers, we welcome the results and the impotence it provides for us to continue our work to ensure that all women, especially young women, have more information, understanding choices and options and agency when it comes to, the, uh, to achieving SRHR. The ECHO trial was designed to provide high quality evidence about potential association between contraceptives, the three that, that is mentioned, and HIV risk acquisition. We have that answer now. However, for us as women, these results are not good news. The women in the trial are our sisters and our mothers and our daughters. They were recruited. sexually active. They did not have the risk factors. They were not recruited because of their risk. We, we, we hear about in so many other HIV prevention trials. The ECHO is a wake-up call for HIV prevention on site at every family clinic, including PrEP, which the South African government continue making a secret and only targeting certain people to access PrEP and not women in this country. A quick question about EMPA has been answered but that does not mean the method can continue to dominate women's choices and programs in East and Southern Africa. We don't believe that DMPA should continue to be the only long-acting method available for too many black women and brown women across the world. The ECHO shows method mix is possible because we've heard the scientists are saying women love DEPO. It's not true. This trial has shown us that women if randomized or if given a choice, will maybe not choose DEPO. So DEPO is not our favorite method. <laughs> Women need strategies to prevent HIV and AIDS. And we've known how corruption and stealing of money meant for programs for women is the cause of why the South African Department of Health and the uh, facilities are failing and women have to wait in long queues. We every day hear about women saying, this is, we, when I go to the clinic, I'm not given a choice. It is talking about depot day, it's talking about pill day. That is not choice. Choice is when I'm given all methods and, I'm to, uh, and I have the choice to choose. So for us, this is the beginning of a long fight. WHO needs to continue and come up as we demanded that better and a faster review happens for this result and guidance for us. And we are happy for that. However, we are watching our governments. We are watching how they're spending the money that's focused on, on, on contraceptives and how women are treated in clinics. So for us, the fight continues. Aluta continua. Thank you very much for all three of those inputs. So can I invite questions from the floor? Um, I think we have microphones on both sides. Would you like to come forward and introduce yourselves with questions or comments? It's always hard being the first. Okay, we have a colleague here. Would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you. Thank you for very good results you presented. I'm Dr. Gosnell here from Durban. I work at King Edward. I did not see in your results if PrEP made any difference to the acquisition of HIV when it was introduced into the trial. Jared? Thank you. Uh, the, so the question was the impact of PrEP on HIV. We are doing a number of additional analyses out of ECHO to understand many, many aspects, including HIV prevention, uh, factors that are related to contraceptive continuation, and of course one of those is PrEP. PrEP was introduced quite late into ECHO because of when it became standard of care, so its impact on HIV incidence in the trial as a whole is, would be small because of the amount of time that it covered. We are doing analyses now that we hope to have done in the next short period to be able to understand at the individual level the degree of H the amount of HIV protection provided by PrEP. Of course, PrEP has already demonstrated to be quite effective, and I think what we feel is a great benefit is that PrEP was able to be used in a trial like this, in settings like this. Thank you. Yes, please. 
Yes, um, thank you for that wonderful trial and wonderful presentation. I'm Euphemia Swanda from Seychelles, Zimbabwe. Please, can you comment on the trend towards a lower risk of acquisition in the implant arm? and also comment on the importance of another trial that includes more contraceptive arms. Who would like to take that, Nelly? Or Jared? No? So I can speak to the first part of that. So across the, th we were, it, the trial was designed to look for a 50% difference, none of the uh, none of the r results show a 50% difference in HIV risk, and uh, and that was the that was the design under which the trial was was operating. Numerically, the numbers are not exactly the same. Statistically, those are not different from each other. We have a sense of the uncertainty in that based on the confidence intervals of the study. I think it is really important to um, r realize as Nellie pointed out as, and as Helen pointed out at the beginning, that some of the work that was an impetus for this result showed differences of twofold or even more, which this trial does not even come close, which this trial clearly rules out. Nellie, could you speak on uh, what about all the other methods? And uh, we've already heard Jürgen commenting that uh, we were had just so everyone knows, we had a real tussle backwards and forwards as to which those three methods should be, but Jared explained why we finally ended on those three. But would you like to comment on, on About all other methods. About all of the other methods and what, what needs to be done, if anything, about that now. Thank you. Thank you for your question. For, I think there are several things we can take home. As Jared said in the results, our results pertain to the methods where women were randomized to. However, uh, because we added the implant, which has levonorgestrel, which is also found in certain oral contraceptive methods, I think you can allude to whether levonorgestrel is in use, or if an IUD has copper but not progesterone. So we're still limited. Um, we cannot. Um, we cannot have. We cannot say anything about net N, and I think that's why Jürgen said that he's, he feels that it's unfortunate that we don't have enough information about Neten, about Depo subcute. Um, I don't know that those trials will be possible. I think it would be very difficult. This trial has taken many years. It was seven, almost 8,000 women over 12 uh, sites. I, I personally feel that our efforts now need to concentrate on safeguarding women from HIV. Whatever it is in the community, the, the risk that you know, young women suffer that exposes them to be susceptible to HIV must be addressed. And I think that's where our focus going forward, if we're going to improve health, uh, must be. I think that would what I would say. And then just to, again, just underline what Jared said, I wouldn't take those numbers to translate to mean that Jadel was doing better. If you look at the hazards ratio, the lines kept overlapping and then moving together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Hi, my question is going to be based to Dr. Pillay. Um, now that the results are out, what is the Department of Health in South Africa planning in terms of way forward? <laughs> And I want to thank the Global Care for always have kept women up to date with the study. But it is really of concern that um, high levels of infections were seen in the study and that PrEP was really used very late in the study. We know that PrEP is known um, to, to, to actually curb the scourge of AIDS and it is proven that we can prevent AIDS. And in this study, where we know there was an association of HIV, you know, we were, there were the perceived association of HIV and contraceptives, and that we didn't take that opportunity to allow women to use PrEP in the study. Jürgen, do you want to comment on that question? 
So the question was, as I understood it, uh, what will the South African government do on the basis of the study? Well, the one thing is that we will certainly uh, look for WHO guidance, but I think we know now quite a lot about what needs to be done. So for some things, we needn't wait for WHO guidance. For example, we know high levels of STI. Uh, we've known that already, that's not new, so we need to do more there. We've got to promote condoms, clearly. Uh, we've got to improve the quality of care. Uh, we've got to scale up use of PrEP. And you know, those things are apart from the results of, of the study. And clearly, we would need to still better inform, I think, as Yvette said, uh, women on all of their contraceptive choices, not just focusing on the ones that are easy to implement at facility level, which is the injectable. And Tim, do you want to just comment on the, once again, on the, 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 the call for, for PrEP in studies and perhaps also reflect on going forward for prevention studies of PrEP? Because the other question, I think, from the first speaker was sort of uh, implying, you know, what was the impact? And clearly, once we really scale up PrEP, what will the, be the impact on the many HIV prevention studies that we still need to undertake? Tim? Yeah, well, thanks, Helen. Um, you know, there were a number of important messages from ECHO. Certainly, the, the findings on the uh, contraceptives are, are quite encouraging, but we all got really quite a wake-up call related to the HIV incidents observed in, in uh, women that were really chosen not for any uh, particular individual risk profile, but just in the communities in which they resided. And, and as Jared pointed out, PrEP was just introduced as part of the prevention package quite late in the study, so we didn't really see an, an effect of that. Going forward, I think it's an imperative that we take the message from ECHO to redouble our efforts to really implement HIV prevention services in family planning facilities so that women have access to everything related to HIV prevention, including pre-exposure prophylaxis. And we really need to use that as, a, as an, an effective tool because we know when women adhere to PrEP, take it regularly, it dramatically decreases the risk for HIV infection. So that, that's imperative. Um, in terms of the next research studies that are going forward, so within the, the, the prevention world, um, there, there is a, an imperative to pro offer participants in studies the best available prevention services, and that's changed quite a lot. So since the beginning of the ECHO study, uh, PrEP has become a, a standard of care in many of the countries in which we're working and many countries in the region. So for other prevention trials, regardless of their vaccine trials or other types of prevention interventions, it'll be necessary to offer the best available prevention, which includes pre-exposure prophylaxis, which um, hopefully will reduce incidence, because we want to reduce incidence in all populations. Uh, however, in trials looking at new prevention modalities, that makes the studies uh, usually larger, because you have fewer HIV infection endpoints, but that's a reality that we have addressed in the past and we need to address going forward. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, Kenneth Nguna from Jomo Kenyatta University. My question regards incidence. So what was the incidence in the communities where these studies were done? Sort of what was the counterfactual incidence without contraception? And then the other question is regarding when did the HIV infections occur? Was it early in the trial or later in the trial? Thank you. Jared? It's an excellent question. So when we designed the ECHO trial, we, an we anticipated that given the mix of study sites that were participating, we could anticipate that a background incidence would be about 3.5% per year. The overall incidence is 3.8% per year. Not really very substantially different than what we had expected, but what, and we don't have, what we don't have is a good measure of what HIV incidence is in communities at the same time, because those data are very hard to find. But we know from other studies going on at the same time that HIV incidence, not only in ECHO, but in other studies, remains too high. And although there have been talks now for several years that it, in different quarters and sometimes in popular press about the end of AIDS, what ECHO emphasizes that HIV transmission is occurring far far too much. And so that is, the, that is our big takeaway point, is a re really a clarion call that HIV incidence remains a great risk for young women and girls at, in, in, these, in these settings. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, 
I wanted to ask a question about the women who participated in the trial going forward, that they'll enjoy the same level of services that they've enjoyed uh, during the trial. So I want some reassurances about that, perhaps. Um, and another question about um, research on HIV prevention. I understand that very few, very little research actually includes women um, in the, um, and this is related specifically also to PrEP, that there is a shortage, I think, of, of, of women participating in PrEP uh, studies. Um, and um, I'm just wondering whether you can maybe uh, offer some guidance as to whether this will be the case and there'll be an increase in research prevention available specifically relating to women. Um, the, the, first, the first part was services after access to services. Nelly, if you'd like to respond to that. Um, so for women participants who are now getting result dissemination, thank you so much, Marisa, and I can see you want to talk about it. So I'm going to ask everyone to be just quite speedy with no. questions and response because we're running out of time and we've got now three more questions. So one of the things we did to each of the participants when they were exiting is ask them about which method they preferred. So if they wanted to switch up or continue with the uh, with the method that they were using and what link facility they were interested in you know, being transferred to. And we checked to see if those facilities were able to continue providing contraceptive services for them. Uh, for facilities which are not able to provide some of those uh, methods, our long-term plan is to be able to support the, to the healthcare providers in those uh, facilities to train them to be able to provide these um, methods. We have found that sometimes the issue is not really the provision of the method, but how to cancel and how to uh, manage side effects, which then becomes something very simple, something that you can, act you can actually do at a very low cost. So going forward, this is what we plan to do. Thank you. Yes, please. Oh, sorry, the second part, I don't think we quite understood. Your second part was prep access in... <coughs> I think in trials... Prevention research for women, is, is there enough of that going on, or? Okay, so, so perhaps I'll just say now that there's actually been quite a lot of studies that have gone on on combination prevention in particular, including PrEP, and quite a lot of lessons learned. But in fact, we had a meeting, Jürgen and myself, and the head of, Glenda Gray, head of the MLC, and other colleagues this morning, and I think that this is a really good time to sweep all of this together and say, let's take stock. What do we know? And how do we, as Jürgen said, translate this now into services? We do have data. We've learned a lot. Now we need to pull that together. So, so just watch that space, and we would undertake to do that. Yes, please. Um, thank you very much for the results. My name is Nyara Zomgodi from the University of Zimbabwe. Um, my question. Perhaps let me agree with Dr. Pillay first that um, would want to know more from qualitative studies. Um, my question is, um, are you planning to have more looking at the disappointing rates of uh, HIV incidence? I wonder if there's anything happening in the vaginal microenvironment. Are there effects from the contraceptives on the vaginal microbiome as well as the immune status in the vaginal microenvironment. And another quick question, um, how did you as uh, investigators ascertain that participants stuck to one method of contraception? We've had participants who go to their GPs and have depo when they are on IUCD or depo when they are on an implant. So just a quick comment on that. Thank you. Jared. Yes, so uh, for the first part, what you hear today is really concentrated on the primary results and a bit of the secondary objectives of ECHO. There will be, for months, for years, analyses going on to understand the, to understand behavior, contraceptive use, other factors, including um, 
many of the women in ECHO participated in ancillary studies where they volunteered for additional sampling to understand microbiome, immunology, virology, and other factors. So that information will be coming out in the future. Um, so very, we're all very much looking forward to that. Um, for for your, your second question, which ascertainment of, ascertainment of method continuation. So as, it's an excellent question. So as mentioned, we tested, um, uh, we tested blood samples from women at the time of enrollment to understand contraceptive use in the period leading up to entry into the study, and DMPA use, uh, DMPIM use at uh, levels that suggested recent use was in a minority of participants in the, in the study. Sample testing is ongoing to understand, uh, we're going to test more samples to understand uh, additional contraceptive use during the study. Nevertheless, the results presented here are the results of an intention to treat analysis of a randomized trial and thus present this, the most robust evidence we can provide. Okay. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Tomo Zokokrai from the African Women and Rising in Cape Town. My question is uh, on participants. We here see that the, um, the rate of retention was quite high in the study. But I'm thinking in terms of disseminating the results, it's going to be the same process to continue. Because for me, as a community member, to get a result for one event and then that's it. It's not fair. Rather, doing, continuing and educate in terms of their own language so that they understand what the results mean. But also post results in terms of access. Now that we see the incidents in depot, what is the options for them moving forward? Yeah, thank you. So I'll, I'll perhaps just uh, say briefly, each site, and we have some of the site APIs here, uh, each site had a plan for dissemination. This was seen as incredibly important, and all the women who participated knew that we would be contacting them to give them the results. <coughs> and each site not only had a plan, but also had a budget which is important when you, you, you can plan, but with no budget, you can't do. Uh, different, the different sites, as you saw, there were 12 sites, chose to do this in different ways. Some did it on an individual one-to-one. -one. Some did it with groups and one-to-one. -one. Some did it as a rolling effect. Um, and each of the sites were also trying to contact women who didn't, for example, come in uh, early on. So, so that site was, was very carefully planned as part of good participatory practice. But now you're saying, what about the next step? And here I would suggest this is where researchers have to hand over to activists. And because the, the researchers can do this piece, but you, you don't want to ask researchers to do all that because they wouldn't be good, for example, as do, doing the community mobilizing piece. They might, they, they, we need to be able to share that with our partners. So when you do research, I do feel that there needs to be this continuation of a continuum of who takes over the baton next. It'll be WHO for global guidance. It must be, as you heard from Yogan, we're going to look at that from a service delivery. But from a community point of view, it's quite clear that we need to also create more demand. Um, and, and demand is so important in holding services accountable, um, as Yogan well knows. I don't know if anyone else wants to add to that. Yvette, do you want to add to that? <coughs> I, I, I think, uh, Helen, for, for women on the ground and, and, and the global care, I think diversity and the issues around getting women to, to be part of the process going forward is very important. I mean, we, we have demanded in, in many ways and forms that WHO include women, especially the global care, on the review committee. So we, uh, we are at the point where we... we we accept the results, it's, the answer. it's an answer to a question, but going forward is how women are taken seriously when it comes to sexual and reproductive health rights. Our women are not pro programs. You cannot have HIV, it's one woman with many issues and the diversity needs to happen. We need to understand that we must diversify issues when it comes to men. I always say in South Africa, our biggest problem when it comes to SRHR is black men and brown men. But when we go globally, 
our biggest issue when it comes to SRHR is white men. So we continuously have an issue where the decisions of women and our lived experience is articulated well by people who are not women. Give women a space, give them a space at the table so that we can articulate our issues. So, um, I, I don't know if Andrew's still here, because he's, he's the chair. Uh, where are you? Uh, I'm, that's why I've got two more. Uh, do I have permission to... I've got three more. Do I have permission to go on for another five minutes? Where are my conference organizers? Okay, I'm going to take a chance, but if people... Is it okay to continue? Okay, thank you. Yes, please. Afternoon, colleagues. Um, my name is Andrew. I think Helen was looking for me. <laughs> I think I have an advice for you, Ken as the, the Deputy Director General at the National Department. All the three speakers and presenters spoke about choice. But initially we know what is happening in the ground. Women are not given choice. Women are coerced as to which type of contraception to use. That is the first point that you need to get to your people at the National Department. They have a right to choose whatever contraception they, they want also, they have a right to education regards the outcomes of the very same contraception they are using. In our facilities, they ask you your name, Andrew Musan, how old, 25, tape, which is not fair. <clears throat> when I was doing my research on surrounding the echo and what is out there that has been used, I've seen that young women in the U.S. and the U.K. are accessing a patch. And, and you look at who is more using it depot. It's women of color. And for me, it really hurts. Because I was born by a woman who didn't have a privilege to be in this kind of a settings. And speak her mind, I would love to concur with Yvette with regards to give women a chance, allow women space, let women speak their mind, and give you what they want. That is the first advice. The second advice is consistency and availability of these contraceptions in our facilities. We have shortages of some of these contraceptives. And you are switched, not being informed of the outcomes of the same contraceptive that we are switching you to, which also can have contraindications with what you had before. Now, you can, my advice is go back to your, to your subordinates and tell them about this report that we accept as activists but also educate those people because young women cannot go to these facilities because a 72-year-old somebody is in that clinic dealing with contraception. My question to the panel, do we have, except South Africans, study participants in this room? Because they, for, for, my understanding would be it would be best if we present this report in front of them because they took an initiative to be part of your study. Thank you. So I'm going to ask Yogan. I mean, the question is new methods and increasing the method mix and, and sustained supplies. Do you want to comment on that? Yes. On the, let me start with the supply. Andrew, thanks very much for the, uh, both the advice and the recommendations. Uh, on the supply issue, this was uh, related to our supplier. So it wasn't an internal issue. It's pretty much like what we are struggling with right now with lamivudine and the back, the back of it, for example. So, you know, we have to also think about the global supply of these uh, products and how the global agencies like WHO can help us do the quantifications, do proper quantifications, so they, we hold also suppliers uh, to account uh, for supply-related challenges. On the issue of uh, choice, I fully agree. On the issue of expanding the method mix, I fully agree. And uh, we are in the process of, of exploring the patch, for example. Thank you. A very brief, uh, if I could ask the last two comments. Yes, please. Um, my question is on the um, high incidence of HIV, um, despite the provision of HIV counseling and PrEP. And I wanted to find out if you could tell us a little bit more about the population or the age groups in which the highest HIV incidence was observed, because I saw in your earlier slide um, over 65% were women under the age of 25, so that's... Uh, Jared? 
the, the HIV incidence, the rate of HIV was higher for women who are under 25 compared to women who are over 25, which I think would, was ex expected and has been seen in many different studies. We haven't done enough, we haven't done a number of more detailed analyses to better understand uh, individuals who are at particular risk of HIV. I think the results really emphasize for us how important it is to get effective HIV prevention, and we would say including much more PrEP than was able to be done in this trial as part of regular service delivery and other clinical studies. Yes, please, last comment. My name is Mokho Malatleha, and I'm from the Sichaba Research Center. Um, thank you for the wonderful results, and I also just want to echo the sentiments of contraceptive choice amongst women. My questions is around the high STI rates that were observed in the trial. Were there any significant differences across the arm? Uh, uh, do you want to turn it again? Yes. So the, re the results presented today, um, th those were STI prevalences at baseline and they were comparable across the three arms. But it's obviously a major concern. So, um, I, I don't think that's a colleague standing up. I think he's thinking about going, or she. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, I think, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, because of time, I'm not going to ask for, for closing comments, unless anyone has got something burning to say. I don't know, James, whether you want to say anything more from WHO perspective, or you covered. Uh, maybe just to, again, uh, echo my thanks to the study team for really a study very well done and uh, very solid uh, results and also to give a WHO commitment to move uh, forward and to answer organ. We hope we could move faster, but I think we also need to move very carefully and make sure that our decisions are right and we, that we get clearer uh, recommendations going forward. Thank you. So I think, I mean, just reflecting and listening here, I mean, I, I, a couple of things really struck me. Um, one is that I think the issue of women's rights is so strongly back on the agenda and I'm thinking back to when I was a medical student where I was a complete activist and somewhere in the middle I went into a lull and now I feel that we're really getting hold of this again and saying how important it, it is and uh, Tim and I were at a meeting in Ghana recently and I gave a talk on, on, on women in science, global health and medicine to a, to a, to a big uh, audience and the, we got a standing ovation because the women there said, we recognize that this is, it resonated to talk about what is happening to women. So I think that that is strongly on the agenda and if ECHO has helped that, that's important. But I think the other thing that I think ECHO has really done from the time that we started to the time that we've, we've got, got to now, I'm gonna try and talk loud over the, the megaphone, um, is, is, is that it's put contraception back onto the agenda uh, alongside its importance for women, alongside our need for better HIV prevention technologies. And it's reminded us of things we've forgotten, like STIs. So I think there are many things that we've got to do and learn from and watch that space for further results. But to all of my colleagues in the audience, to my colleagues on the, the stage here, those involved and those who've commented, thank you very much indeed for your contributions uh, the, and the donors. We have donor